running a bit late. Brian, do you want to just kick off with a few things that you thought were interesting in your discussions? Yeah, just Brian Hughes. Um, I suppose we went through a bit of an exercise of uh, starting off with one, jumping to four, and then having a discussion at the end of it all, um, and missing out on the other dot points, I think. Um, basically, on the, I suppose the question is about standardised soil sampling. We, we really did struggle. I think the, the easy answer was no. <laughs> um, and, and it was really a case of fit for purpose um, with a whole range of qualifiers on that from you know, the, the need under research or for confirming models is probably quite different. Um, the uh, confirming soil changes, um, I suppose, moving through to soil carbon accounting systems in their purest form, but there was this whole discussion about models versus actual measuring soil changes, um, needing to understand confidence levels required. Um, I suppose the fourth question about what can soil scientists do to help, again, we had a, a fairly uh, uh, long debate on that, I suppose, in, in you know, where the community's at in terms of understanding greenhouse gases and, and whether they've moved on to other things, I suppose. Some of the claims of politicians, you know, whether, whether we're there to sort of provide reality to those. <laughs> um, and also to make, I suppose, the community aware of what's possible. And also, I suppose, where this fits into the carbon farming uh, system. Um, and then probably moved on to really what, what uh, farmers can do in terms of soil carbon measurement and things and, and is it a useful for, for farmers to measure soil carbon given the, I suppose, the confusion about some of the methods and results. And we certainly felt that there is a strong case for farmers getting more information. Uh, we'd really love to see more benchmarking of that information so that you know, farmers and, I suppose, advisors can access a lot of carbon measurements for a certain district, for example. Um, felt there was a, a strong need for consistent sampling guidelines and information to be provided again at the farming level about, uh, I suppose, getting rid of some of that variation that we've seen in some of the measurements. So, <coughs> so things like uh, consistent sampling guidelines, uh, using the same methods, uh, using the same labs in some cases to, to reduce, the, I suppose, the variation. And also some information on how to really reduce the cost of, uh, um, for the, I suppose, the farmer landholder end of, of actually being able to measure soil carbon accurately and get, get the results they need to justify the, I suppose, the carbon farming payments. Um, the, uh, that's probably about it, I think. That, uh, certainly, that, I suppose, our discussion ended up, particularly at that farmer end of it, how do we make this a bit more of a user-friendly type of option. Thanks Brian. My name is Cameron Grant. Um, our group over here looked at all of the questions but we settled on the last one which is after today's talk what is it that we don't know about soil sampling analysis and carbon accounting purposes? Well frankly aside from the uh, political uncertainty we don't know anything about that and within the next few years it may all get turned on its head which is a worry to some of our, uh, the people who are investing a lot of money in uh, testing and measurement and so on. So aside from that, uh, somebody in our group said that we've got a, perhaps a 20 year window for this whole issue, that, it, that technologies and things are gonna change so much that really if we're going to have an impact and if we're gonna do anything, it's gotta be in the next 20 years maximum. So that was interesting. Uh, this is not going to be something that the government is going to be throwing a lot of money at 20 years from now. Uh, so some of the things we don't understand are the timing of measurable changes. And given that Lynn talked about uh, the amount of carbon that can, the range and the amounts of carbon that are held in the soil range from 20 to 60 uh, tons per hectare, and the uncertainty in some of the measurements, uh, we need to be able to to provide as soil scientists and people who measure carbon, uh, how long it's going to take to make management practices, uh, changes in management practices that will have a measurable effect. So we don't feel we've got a good handle on that yet. Is that fair comment, Lynn, do you reckon?
All right, so watch this space in SCARP. If you don't have information about how long it's going to take for change to occur, Sure. I, I don't think we were suggesting that people would lock into a precise management practice for 20 years. I think it's more the issue of uh, guiding principles of management uh, that are in question. Okay, so the other, the second question we wanted was about the uncertainty of laboratory method measurements, and Walkley Black was a good example of that, where there are tremendous uncertainties. And uh, out of that came the idea that really we should be offering people as I mean th one of the questions was what can we as soil scientists do to contribute to the conversation with the community and one of them is that we ought to be offering uh, the idea that un there is uncertainty in the measurements and that that is acceptable we will never get a precise measurement of everything to within a political politically acceptable uh, argument standards and so we need to be contributing to the idea that variability is part of life in every part of nature and that you know maybe we can contribute to the the visualization of acceptable error in measurements so um, the other issue that or question we felt that we didn't really understand enough about was sampling field sampling uncertainty particularly in intensively managed systems where we have a lot of uh, crop residue and zero tillage where a lot of the nutrients get concentrated at the top and so you've got this stratification of and if you start mixing things uh, then you dilute that all right and the last thing we asked about or one of the questions we had was how can a land manager add carbon to the soil economically uh, and we had discussions about trees and adding biochar and other biochemicals. Um, I'm Lara. Um, we had a bit of a talk as well about the, the relationship between sampling and relating it to carbon accounting, the fact of driving down the cost of um, sampling soils, um, decreasing variability in all these samples. Um, we couldn't agree on what the right depth of a sample should be. Should it be 30 centimetres or 10 centimetres? And the fact that you can get different carbon values from that one sample. Um, then there was the issue of how intense should the sampling be and we discussed maybe um, doing some bulk sampling so and if a farmer has to go back every year and take a, another sample from that same area he has to go back to the same area and maybe um, have some intense bulk sampling of that area um, and maybe some consistency in keeping a grid of that sampling um, and the issues of topo um, topography and vegetation and how many um, samples you should take from one area and how much is practical. Um, and we acknowledge that it's important to be able to measure the variance and acknowledge the uncertainty in our um, measurements and the am amount of error. And yep, talked about that. Um, and then we had a bit of a discussion about how we've got all this great technology um, in terms of spectroscopically being able to analyse these samples, but maybe it's not quite meeting our needs and demands just yet. And we touched on fractionation. That would be more important to be able to spectroscopically 
do the fractionation of soils as opposed to chemically altering the soils. And, and finally, maybe we thought about all of this information we're talking about today, sending some reports into the politicians and the policy makers and seeing if we can help them understand a bit of what's going on and hopefully instruct them a bit. That's fine. <laughs> okay, first things first, I think if you've got an auditor and they're charging, like Ernst & Young, $4,500 a day for compliance and audit, if we're going to run this process through, I think we're going to have to fairly quickly work out how much uncertainty we've got in our systems and get something to work with. You've got the buy side, the big emitters, they'll buy your offsets, the market's going to be short in carbon. I think long term, so we're going to have to put something together. Bill suggested slattery in that meeting. We didn't discuss too much except everything from <laughs> accreditation, dealing with uncertainty, uh, the compliance and audit to a degree, standardised testing, getting a national standard for that testing because you can't send anyone into the paddock. The farmer's not going to do that. Obviously, you're going to have to get a recognised professional accreditation for the guys doing the sampling, the crews that measure the carbon. Uh, we discussed whether it's just carbon that we do measure, and quite possibly not when you look at nitrous oxide. We mentioned briefly erosion, even herbicide burden in soils and the effect the Americans are now talking about in soils. We need to manage and monitor that. But I think the market's ready for what we can produce. We just have to get a set of standards um, to build on that. Um, correlating models we talked about, and Katrina from the Chem Centre discussing with Jeff Proudfoot, the different testing and also realising you've got to get the volume through at lower cost if you're going to do a large volume, but you have to have the accuracy, discussing triple replicate work, and then the variance from the mean of that of only being about 1% on those values. So I think what we summarised was we've got the means and the methods. Yes, there's a degree of uncertainty, but I think if we cater to that uncertainty um, and do it now, and Bill's suggesting we get a series of groups going, or well one group, but a series of different subgroups to decide what we need to do to be able to measure it because the market's there. And we discussed the value to the farmer. Is it worth doing? Uh, Nigel Wilhelm didn't realise the additionality rules had changed, and I don't know if some people do realise that, but before you couldn't actually have a practice or a change in your farming methodology that would generate more profit. It had to be done solely for offsetting carbon or abating nitrous oxide, but now you can actually profit from that. It's only just changed. But all in all, um, yeah, we think it's all there. We just have got to put together a series of methodologies and work out which ones deal with uncertainty the most. Luckily, hopefully um, those discussions were useful for you and I'll try and capture the notes from those and, uh, and put all those together at some point. Um, I was planning to summarise at the end of the day but because we're running 15 minutes late I'm actually going to drop, drop that session off so we're still going to finish on time. Um, and so I'd like to introduce our last speaker before afternoon tea, Dave Davenport. And Dave's paper is actually shared with uh, Amanda Chappelle who's also here. Dave's from Port Lincoln and Amanda's from Lenswood and... Um, We've got a bio in there, so I won't read it all. Anyway, look forward to, Dave, to your presentation on some knowledge gaps. Thank you. Um, yes, as um, previously indicated, this is actually a joint presentation. I'm standing up here doing the talking, but most of the intellectual work was done by Amanda Chapel here, who's the brains of the outfit. Um, and we've been involved in... Uh, the sampling protocols or, or working on the SCARP project with Lynn. Plus we've also been doing quite a bit of analysis looking at um, looking at um, modified soils, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in this presentation. And one of the things about soil carbon is, is that 
my question, and I'm going to really present this more as a person who actually operates out in the field and does a lot of sampling, but also looks at a lot of trial work, and there are questions about things which don't add up. So we can see it. We think we can measure it, even though there's a lot of debate about actually how good that measurement is. Um, we've got a pretty good idea of what, it made, what it's made of. We think we know how it gets there. But we have a pretty patchy but detailed knowledge about relationships to soil structure, water holding capacity and other components of what's happening in the soil. So my question to you is do we actually understand the interaction between soil carbon and other biochemical processes, and particularly in relationship to plant growth and production. Now, what really raised my issue was looking at one of the graveyard plots. This is one of Robin Graham's old sites. We went around the state and dug a number of holes and then backfilled them with various treatments. Um, they were called graveyards because basically they did look, the plot was about the size of a grave excavation. Um, and some of the treatments involved putting seaweed back in the mix, um, putting down trace elements and other mineral nutrients down through the profile, a gypsum, and there was also treatment where he dug out the existing soil and then just filled it with topsoil. And this was the result. And obviously you can see that there's something happening there. Um, bear in mind that the next slide will show you this plot here which doesn't actually look too good in that particular photo. But if you look at it now, and I hope people can see this, there is a canola patch through here, which is clearly well ahead of the other. And that site we looked at uh, in 2003. So this was approximately 11 or 12 years after the initial uh, treatment was that, and this is the only plot which is still actually showing up. Interestingly, when we sampled the site where the um, grass clippings had been placed, at 40 to 50 centimetres, we started to find intact grass clippings 12 years later. So, um, what's interesting about that, obviously, is this is a really poor soil type, it's a uh, highly weathered. Uh, ancient clay with ironstone, significant levels of ironstone gravel. Um, so it has got a lot of problems apart from organic carbon. The analysis was also interesting in that the only thing which really significantly varied was soil carbon. All the rest of the treatments had quite high phosphorus levels, at least down to sort of 30 centimetres. Other issues such as potassium, pH, salinity, they weren't there as a constraint, but we're still seeing differences in growth. So my question is why? And the big question for me is why have we got such high levels of organic carbon right down the profile? Because that is very unusual. Is this an artefact of using the topsoil which has an organic carbon level of about 1.5%? So does that mean that the organic carbon which was in the topsoil, which was down there, has just not gone anywhere? Or has the increased level of crop production in the last few years helped maintain that organic carbon level? Or what actually is driving that result? So another site which really got me thinking, this is a sandy, it's a sandy duplex soil down in the southeast. Again, I hope you can see that there are some green lines in the crop. These are related to a, uh, the farmer tried to delve clay up into the topsoil but didn't quite reach the clay. And um, these are the rip lines, if you like, within the crop. Now, this is interesting because we dug a pit across these lines and crop's dying on the surface. At 30 centimetres, the sand was damp enough to actually clump together. There was loads of moisture there, except for one location. And that was in, uh, so here's the profile. You can actually see where the rip time came down through here. 
And you can also see an area of organic stained material which has fallen behind the tine, which on the photograph on the left, you can actually see is here, and there is a lot of root mass in there. The soil below this area was dry, whereas immediately over to here was wet. So again, that raised some questions for me and others about what's actually happening here. What's the response to? Is this a physical response? But many times we've undertaken deep ripping in soils and sands and the results are very mixed. We often don't see a response. Have we got a response here? Is it a physical issue or is it something else? Um, another site which we've developed at Eda Lily, this is a spading trial. Now for those who don't know a spader, it's just basically a big rotary hoe which can mix the soil profile down to about 40 centimetres. Um, in Europe this is common practice because they incorporate a lot of their um, dry matter. Some of these spaders in Europe can actually go down to two metres, I've been told. Goodness knows what sort of machine that would be. Um, but this is an interesting site in that we compared just spading to the control with no spading. And we also undertook an area where we incorporated the equivalent of about 10 to 15 tonne of loosened straw into the profile. You can see in this area up here, an area which is higher and further advanced. That was the area where the loosened straw was incorporated. We did it in a, basically a double replicate. Um, now my, again, my question is what difference is loosened straw making here? Now on this particular site, um, waterlogging can be an issue, but the spading didn't seem to show any real benefit. Um, the benefit is largely, mainly around loosened straw. Would it be a nutritional benefit? Nigel, you might have a two bobs worth on that, but for lupins, what's loosened straw going to provide the lupins at that stage, which is going to deliver that level of growth? There's something else happening, I suspect. The yield also confirms what we saw visually. So the spaded with hay treatments were both clearly above the other treatments. Interestingly on that trial, the following year canola was sown and there was a significant increase in canola, particularly where the loosened straw was incorporated. This year it's under wheat. Uh, we haven't got the results back yet, but there's a visual difference again on those areas. So what's the response to? Um, this is a site at uh, Ungarra. Terry Young's at Ungarra. This again is a sand over clay. I've spoiled a shot by putting myself in there. But on the same paddock, um, Terry spaded in some vetch in a couple of strips. Same paddock. That's Terry, and he's actually taller than I am. So there's something happening there which is pretty significant. Now, are we talking nutrition? That particular crop, because of a relatively wet season we had that year, actually had five nitrogen applications throughout the season. So I don't know if it's nitrogen, but there's something happening. Um, a very clear difference by looking at the plants is the difference in root depth and percentage of root mass. It's pretty obvious what's happening there, and you can you can see that clearly where the spading had occurred with the vetch put in, we've got a lot more root mass. Um, this isn't just confined to the work we're doing. Peter Sale in Victoria was involved in putting organic manures deeper into the profile, and he's seen significant responses. So it's not just a one-off and it's not just on sandy soils we're seeing. Um, and there has been other work done in this state previously. I think Nigel did some work around Riddell and on York Peninsula looking at organic material in the profile. So there, you know, there's a fair bit of interest. This is in Thailand, this is from Andrew Noble. Um, 
This is a recommended soil improvement practice, which you wouldn't recommend too much, I wouldn't think. This is where they've incorporated bentonite, and that's where they've put in bentonite plus compost. Now, the actual yield data on those was that the compost was significantly better than just bentonite on its own. And apparently in Thailand and Vietnam, they actually crush up termite mounds and incorporate them into their plots, which is interesting. Okay, so obviously there's some things we know. Clearly that there is a relationship between soil organic carbon and depth. Um, it will go down as you go down the profile. There is also a relationship between soil organic carbon and rainfall. Now this is data which Amanda's been pulled out of the ASRIS database and we've done some statistical analysis on. Um, pretty good correlation, obviously. The interesting thing for me is the difference between the maximum and the minimum. It's huge. And if we're talking about being able to cash in on some form of carbon credits, I mean, how, how, how do you go from this to this is going to be the question. Because that difference adds up to a lot of dollars. If we were talking $20 a tonne, that's, that's a pretty big outcome. Okay. Um, texture. We know texture has an impact. Um, this is texture over different rainfall zones. Um, this is in the 0 to 10. Um, you can see that what we would expect is sandy soils have less organic carbon than clay soils. Again, what's interesting, there actually isn't much movement between the 300 and the 500 mil rainfall area. Um, if you want to look at it from a if we just pick the 400 to 500 mil rainfall zone though, if you look at the values, there's still a clear difference in each of the textures between minimum values and maximum values. And we're talking double at least. Or even if you take out a few outliers, the general, you know, there's a general major difference. Why? If it's not rainfall, if it's not texture, why is that difference there? Is it all down to land use? Don't know. So, when you look at the um, bars of variation there, you can see what I'm talking about. We're talking pretty significant differences. Now, one of the things um, we've been involved in developing um, a group um, looking at soil modification, an opportunity for increasing carbon levels through building clay, clay levels of soil. And when we come down to talk about research gaps, within a three quarter of an hour session between the group of us, we came up with over 40 areas of significant research which we didn't think we had the answers to. So there are a lot of gaps. Um, when we talk about clay mineralogy, um, we know that there are some studies out there, Barzagar et al, uh, pointing out obviously that there are differences between protection offered by different forms of clay to organic carbon. Um, what rolled iron and aluminium oxides have in carbon reten retention? A question which we don't think we've got the answers to. Um, what's the effect of clay, ESP, salinity and pH? Paul Nelson and others concluded that following a large addition of organic matter, retention of car organic carbon and sodic soil would not be improved by a prior reduction in ESP. That sort of goes against what we would intuitively feel that if you've got less sodicity, more root mass, greater carbon opportunity. Um, clay particle charge related to organic carbon. Um, we don't know. Bulk density relationships to organic carbon. 
we've done a bit of work looking at some of this stuff. When you look at modified sands, we looked at the relationship between cation exchange capacity and total carbon. Very poor correlation. Perhaps a bit surprising. I myself would have thought that soils with higher CEC would have generated more soil carbon. Uh, when we look at bulk density, again, very poor correlation. Now admittedly this is just one data set and there's probably other research out there which perhaps shows the opposite. If it does, it'd be interesting to find out why. But we're not seeing good correlations. Um, another question is about nitrogen form and soil organic carbon. Um, there's been a, a bit of work published from the states just recently uh, looking at the Morrow research plots which actually suggests that high use of synthetic N has resulted in a decline in soil organic carbon, particularly in subsoils. Now, we don't know whether that actually is an issue here, but it was recognised back as far as 1947 that that may be the case. And Mulvaney et al, looking at the um, Morrow analysis, published that paper which to them was quite a red flag about how we're using nitrogen and what its impact on organic carbon is. I don't know what, I don't think there have been any studies here done in that area, maybe someone could correct me about that. Beca behaviour of SOM, um, does it decompose to predictable C fractions? And one of the interesting bits of work which I think has been done recently is looking at the relationship or what happens to soil carbon when you put fresh SOM back into the soil. And um, Fontaine et al noted that the addition of fresh SOM seemed to result in mineralisation of old carbon. And he's talking about carbon two and a half thousand years old was reactivated. So what does this mean about our perception that a portion of the soil carbon pool is pretty much inert and locked away for good? Doesn't seem that up. And then the other question is what is it about fresh organic material which actually generates that attack of older carbon? Next question is how long do we before we reach a new equilibrium. If we put fresh organic material back in, which is something we're investigating, how long does it take to reach a new equilibrium, particularly when you may actually be attacking some of the old carbon which is in there? So there are sort, sort of things which, if we're going into some sort of carbon market and farmers, particularly from an organic um, viewpoint, are putting in organic fertilisers and green manuring and those sorts of things, how are we actually going to be able to measure that? How long do we have to wait before we actually can come up with an answer? And Aung Tong concluded that mechanistic models are missing a large and important pool. So without that data, without that knowledge, how can we actually estimate or come up with some figures which somebody can then on sell or propose as a methodology to be able to access these carbon markets. The other area of interest, particularly for me, is what's the relationship to nutritional elements. Um, there are some suggestions that if we add organic carbon to our soils, that we're going to start to tie up phosphorus and other elements. Is that actually the case? Yes, we know that soil organic matter or soil um, humus and those sorts of fractions actually hold, compose or comprised of things like phosphorus. But is that phosphorus stuff which comes out of the fertiliser bin or is that phosphorus which has been locked up through other processes and perhaps been held in the soil for a fair while? Certainly on the west coast of Air Peninsula you'll find calcareous soils which regularly suffer from phosphorus deficiency with total phosphorus levels of 200 plus. 
So, you know, it, that, that's a real important question I think we need to look at at some stage. Because if a farmer's going to be thinking, well, I'm going to increase more organic carbon, but it's going to cost me more in lock up of phosphorus than what any carbon credit's going to do, what's the point? And that's again where, where these elements obtain from. Um, soil biology in relationship to plant growth. Uh, there's probably a fair bit of work which has been done in relationship to carbon to microbial biomass, uh, species relationship, disease and pathogens, but I still think there's a way to go. Certainly glomalin has become a bit of a talking point, which I don't think we've got a lot of good information and data on. Um, and particularly from a practical point of view, how do we actually measure this stuff? You know, I, I don't know that there are particularly good benchmarks out there or particularly good understanding of the species mix involved in soil biology. And one of the key things which we're noticing is plant root mass and distribution. Um, this is from a site at uh, Angara where we spaded a site in autumn and then we spaded it the following year in, in spring and then we compared it to an unspaded site. We had a significant increase in dry matter production um, significant increase in dry matter production, regardless of any nutritional treatment, where the site had been spaded in the previous spring. Okay, so where there was more organic material incorporated in spring compared to when it was incorporated in autumn, we saw a significant response in dry matter production. It didn't equate into yield, the, the yield was basically uh, consistent across the plot, um, but it was exceptionally high yield, so you know whether we came up against some other limitation, I'm, I can't be sure. But it was just interesting that we, we saw that response. What was also interesting was we undertook root DNA analysis, and it was very clear that in the spring spading where the more organic material had been incorporated, we had a much higher level of root DNA in the 10 to 30 centimetre layer than in the other two treatments. And that correlates with other sites we've seen where we think we're getting much more root mass, particularly in the subsoil layers where we've got organic material incorporated. Okay, so I'll come back to my original proposal. And this is Six et al, who basically undertook a study in 2004 which really reinforces what I've been suggesting in that reviewing the progress made over the last 50 years, there are still very few studies with a quantitative and or considered interactive effects of between the five factors controlling um, plant growth and production in soils. And I think one of the key missing links in all this is what actually, what role does soil organic carbon play in supporting the relationships between these five factors? Thanks, David. Uh, Azam, I work in soil physics group here in Adelaide. Um, uh, by looking at your presentation, I have found that you showed the relationship between rainfall and organic matter. And again, you showed the soil depth and organic matter, which is quite understandable. And then you, again, you showed the bulk density and organic matter, and you showed that there is no relationships. Actually, I was wondering the range of bulk density you have shown there is from one to two. And I was wondering how it is related to those depth and rainfall and soil texture things. 
does it vary that much within a specific day and rainfall? Um, it doesn't seem to. No, it seems to be relatively consistent in that the bulk densities don't seem to have that much impact within those relationships. Um, Certainly the large variability we see within organic carbon levels within a texture within a rainfall zone, um, we don't really have a good idea of what's driving that and we need to analyse the data at a much closer level of detail, I think, before we can start to draw any conclusions. Uh, three years ago we undertook a study comparing sites um, under different land use, and certainly SCARP is currently doing that, but we haven't got the SCARP data back yet. Um, and I guess just a comment, which unfortunately Bill's not here, is that I actually suspect that some of our sites comparing soil carbon under cropping and agricultural systems compared to native vegetation probably won't show much difference. It's just an initial view. And certainly there has been some work done, and I think James Hall's got some, from the pastoral areas, which indicates that as well. Yeah, thanks, Murray. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the Morrow plots. Um, mm -hmm. There has been a, a, a severe criticism of that analysis because it's confounded uh, crop type, rotation, and uh, um, cultivation in that in that uh, analysis. And there's been a few few things published that doubt whether mm -hmm. the you know the conclusions are right. But in terms of what in Australia, we've, I run a uh, long-term uh, fertiliser experiment at Horsham that has uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and certainly there's no no equivocation that um, soil organic carbon has increased due to both nitrogen and phosphorus in that experiment over 16 years. So, um, and that's top 10 and uh, 10 to 30. So, you know, I, I wouldn't. I think you, I wouldn't be too concerned about. Uh, good nitrogen management on um, and uh, depleting soil organic carbon. I guess, I guess just in response to that, I, I think yes, there's certainly some questions about the Morrow data, but they did. The authors did point out that they thought it was excessive synthetic end use, and I mean, I guess there is the theory that certainly nitrogen does support. Um, soil carbon breakdown, so I still think there might be something there, but yeah. It's just a question, a lot of the work on global limb was done here in Adelaide, and, but I've lost touch. What's happened to it in the last few years? <laughs> well, there are probably better people out there to answer it than me, but certainly um, it's become quite a, almost a flagship of um, the organic farming group, particularly led by Christine Jones who's really raising glomal and is quite a, quite a, uh, a neglected issue. Um, and s I have seen some data which suggests that those people who have gone into perennial pasture systems over a long period of time are seeing significant increases in organic carbon deeper in the profile and Christine has, has done some work with those people which is suggesting that there's raised levels of glomal and are involved in that process. But uh, yeah, look, it's, it still needs a lot of work, I think. Uh, it, it needs to come more into mainstream science, I think, and perhaps be more in, in, in the organic lobby. Just, I suppose, corroborating your point about the abuse of soil nitrogen, a common thing we see in Sydney is the use of poultry and among market gardeners, if some's good, then more's got to be better. And the classic situation would be, you know, I had an available phosphorus of a thousand parts per million um, and organic carbon of less than one percent. The, the poultry manure just burns up organic carbon. Uh, they mistakenly think it improves it, but it doesn't, I can assure you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, back here at uh, 3.15 if we can, and 3.20.